Chapter 19 of The Iron Heel by Jack London This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matt Saw Transformation You must make yourself over again, Ernest wrote to me. You must cease to be. You must become another woman, and not merely in the clothes you wear, but inside your skin, under the clothes. You must make yourself over again so that even I would not know you. Your voice, your gestures, your mannerisms, your carriage, your walk, everything. This command I obeyed. Every day I practiced for hours in burying forever the old Avis Everhard beneath the skin of another woman who I may call my other self. It was only by long practice that such results could be obtained. In the mere detail of voice intonation, I practiced almost perpetually till the voice of my new self became fixed, automatic. It was this automatic assumption of a role that was considered imperative. One must become so adept as to deceive oneself. It was like learning a new language, say the French. At first, speech in French is self-conscious, a matter of the will. The student thinks in English and then transmutes into French, or reads in French but transmutes into English before he can understand. Then, later, becoming firmly grounded, automatic. The student reads, writes, and thinks in French, without any recourse to English at all. And so, with our disguises. It was necessary for us to practice until our assumed roles became real, until to be our original selves would require a watchful and strong exercise of will. Of course, at first, much was mere blundering experiment. We were creating a new art, and we had much to discover. But the work was going on everywhere. Masters in the art were developing, and a fund of tricks and expedients was being accumulated. This fund became a sort of textbook that was passed on, a part of the curriculum, as it were, of the school of revolution. Note. Disguise did become a veritable art during that period. The revolutionists maintained schools of acting in all their refuges. They scorned accessories such as wigs and beards, false eyebrows and such aids of the theatrical actors. The game of revolution was a game of life and death, and mere accessories were traps. Disguise had to be fundamental, intrinsic, part and parcel of one's being, second nature. The Red Virgin is reported to have been one of the most adept in the art, to which must be ascribed her long and successful career. It was at this time that my father disappeared. His letters, which had come to me regularly, ceased. He no longer appeared at our Pell Street quarters. Our comrades sought him everywhere. Through our secret service, we ransacked every prison in the land. But he was lost as completely as if the earth had swallowed him up, and to this day... No clue to his end has been discovered. Note. Disappearance was one of the horrors of the time. As a motif in song and story, it constantly crops up. It was an inevitable concomitant of the subterranean warfare that raged through those three centuries. This phenomenon was almost as common in the oligarch class and the labor caste as it was in the ranks of the revolutionists. Without warning, without trace, men and women, and even children, disappeared and were seen no more, their end shrouded in mystery. Six lonely months I spent in the refuge, but they were not idle months. Our organization went on apace, and there were mountains of work always waiting to be done. Ernest and his fellow leaders, from their prisons, decided what should be done, and it remained for us on the outside to do it. There was the organization of the mouth-to-mouth -mouth propaganda, the organization with all its ramifications of our spy system, the establishment of our secret printing presses, and the establishment of our underground railways, which meant the knitting together of all our myriads of places of refuge, and the formation of new refuges where links were missing in the chains we ran over all the land. So I say, the work was never done. At the end of six months, my loneliness was broken by the arrival of two comrades. They were young girls, brave souls and passionate lovers of liberty. Laura Peterson, who disappeared in 1922, and Kate Bierce, who later married Du Bois, and who is still with us with eyes lifted to tomorrow's sun that heralds in the new age. Note. Du Bois, the present librarian of Ardis, is a lineal descendant of this revolutionary pair. The two girls arrived in a flurry of excitement, danger, and sudden death. In the crew of the fishing boat that conveyed them across San Pablo Bay was a spy, a creature of the Iron Heel. He had successfully masqueraded as a revolutionist and penetrated deep into the secrets of our organization. Without doubt, he was on my trail for we had long since learned that my disappearance had been cause of deep concern to the secret service of the oligarchy. Luckily, as the outcome proved, he had not divulged his discoveries to anyone. He had evidently delayed reporting, preferring to wait until he had brought things to a successful conclusion by discovering my hiding place and capturing me. 
His information died with him. Under some pretext, after the girls had landed at Petaluma Creek and taken to the horses, he managed to get away from the boat. Partway up Sonoma Mountain, John Carlson let the girls go on, leading his horse, while he went back on foot. His suspicions had been aroused. He captured the spy, and as to what then happened, Carlson gave us a fair idea. I fixed him, was Carlson's unimaginative way of describing the affair. I fixed him, he repeated, while a somber light burnt in his eyes, and his huge, toil-distorted hands opened and closed eloquently. He made no noise. I hid him, and tonight I will go back and bury him deep. During that period, I used to marvel at my own metamorphosis. At times it seemed impossible, either that I had ever lived a placid, peaceful life in a college town, or that I had become a revolutionist, inured to scenes of violence and death. One or the other could not be. One was real, the other was a dream. But which was which? Was this present life of a revolutionist hiding in a hole a nightmare? Or was I a revolutionist, who had somewhere, somehow, dreamed that in some former existence I have lived in Berkeley, and never known a life more violent than teas and dances, debating societies and lectures rooms? but then I suppose this was a common experience of all of us who had rallied under the red banner of the Brotherhood of Man. I often remembered figures from that other life, and curiously enough, they appeared and disappeared now and again in my new life. There was Bishop Morehouse. In vain we searched for him after our organization had developed. He had been transferred from asylum to asylum. We traced him from the state hospital for the insane at Napa to the one in Stockton, and from there to the one in the Santa Clara Valley called Anus, and there the trail ceased. There was no record of his death. In some way he must have escaped. Little did I dream of the awful manner in which I was to see him once again, the fleeting glimpse of him in the whirlwind carnage of the Chicago Commune. Jackson, who had lost his arm in the Sierra Mills, and who had been the cause of my own conversion into a revolutionist, I never saw again, but we all knew what he did before he died. He never joined the revolutionists. Embittered by his fate, brooding over his wrongs, he became an anarchist, not a philosophic anarchist, but a mere animal, mad with hate and lust for revenge. And well, he revenged himself. Evading the guards, in the night time while all were asleep, he blew the Pertonwaithe palace into atoms. Not a soul escaped, not even the guards. And in prison, while awaiting trial, he suffocated himself under his blankets. Dr. Hammerfield and Dr. Ballingford achieved quite different fates from that of Jackson. They have been faithful to their salt, and they have been correspondingly rewarded with ecclesiastical palaces wherein they dwell at peace with the world. Both are apologists for the oligarchy. Both have grown very fat. Dr. Hammerfield, as Ernest once said, has succeeded in modifying his metaphysics so as to give God's sanction to the iron heel, and also to include much worship of beauty and to reduce to an invisible wreath the gaseous vertebrate described by Haeckel. The difference between Dr. Hammerfield and Dr. Ballingford being that the latter has made the god of the oligarchs a little more gaseous and a little less vertebrate. Peter Donnelly, the scab foreman at the Sierra Mills, whom I encountered while investigating the case of Jackson, was a surprise to all of us. In 1918, I was present at a meeting of the Frisco Reds. Of all our fighting groups, this one was the most formidable, ferocious, and merciless. It was really not a part of our organization. Its members were fanatics, madmen. We dared not encourage such a spirit. On the other hand, though they did not belong to us, we remained on friendly terms with them. It was a matter of vital importance that brought me there that night. I, alone in the midst of a score of men, was the only person unmasked. After the business that brought me there was transacted, I was led away by one of them. In a dark passage, this guide struck a match, and holding it close to his face, slipped back his mask. For a moment I gazed upon the passion-wrought features of Peter Donnelly. Then the match went out. "'I just wanted you to know it was me,' he said in the darkness. "'Do you remember Dallas, the superintendent?' I nodded at recollection of the vulpine-faced superintendent of the Sierra Mills. "'Well, I got him first, Donnelly said with pride. "'It was after that I joined the Reds.' "'But how comes it that you were here?' I queried. "'Your wife and children?' "'Dead,' he answered. "'That's why.' No, he went on hastily. Tis not revenge for them. They died easily in their beds. Sickness, you see, one time and another. They tied my arms while they lived. And now that they're gone, tis revenge for my blasted manhood I'm after. I was once Peter Donnelly, the scab foreman. But tonight, I'm number 27 of the Frisco Reds. 
Come on now, and I'll get you out of this. More I heard of him afterward. In his own way, he had told the truth when he said all were dead. But one lived, Timothy, and him his father considered dead, because he had taken service with the Iron Heel and the mercenaries. Note. In addition to the labor castes, there arose another caste, the military. A standing army of professional soldiers was created, officered by members of the oligarchy and known as the mercenaries. This institution took the place of the militia, which had proved impracticable under the new regime. Outside the regular secret service of the Iron Heel, there was further established a secret service of the mercenaries, this latter forming a connecting link between the police and the military. A member of the Frisco Reds pledged himself to twelve annual executions. The penalty for failure was death. A member who failed to complete his number committed suicide. These executions were not haphazard. This group of madmen met frequently and passed wholesale judgments upon offending members and servitors of the oligarchy. The executions were afterward apportioned by lot. In fact, the business that brought me there the night of my visit was such a trial. One of our own comrades, who for years had successfully maintained himself in a clerical position in the local bureau of the Secret Service of the Iron Heel, had fallen under the ban of the Frisco Reds and was being tried. Of course he was not present, and of course his judges did not know that he was one of our men. My mission had been to testify to his identity and loyalty. It may be wondered how we came to know of the affair at all. The explanation is simple. One of our secret agents was a member of the Frisco Reds. It was necessary for us to keep an eye on friend as well as foe, and this group of madmen was not too unimportant to escape our surveillance. But to return to Peter Donnelly and his son— all went well with Donnelly until in the following year he found among the sheaf of executions that fell to him the name of Timothy Donnelly. Then it was that that clannishness, which was his to so extraordinary a degree, asserted itself. To save his son, he betrayed his comrades. In this he was partially blocked, but a dozen of the Frisco Reds were executed, and the group was well-nigh destroyed. In retaliation, the survivors meted out to Donnelly the death he had earned by his treason— nor did Timothy Donnelly long survive. The Frisco Reds pledged themselves to his execution. Every effort was made by the oligarchy to save him. He was transferred from one part of the country to another. Three of the Reds lost their lives in vain efforts to get him. The group was composed only of men. In the end, they fell back on a woman, one of our comrades, and none other than Anne Royalston. Our inner circle forbade her, but she had ever a will of her own and disdained discipline. Furthermore, she was a genius and lovable— and we could never discipline her anyway. She is in a class by herself, and not amenable to the ordinary standards of the revolutionists. Despite our refusal to grant permission to do the deed, she went on with it. Now Anna Royalston was a fascinating woman. All she had to do was to beckon a man to her. She broke the hearts of scores of our young comrades, and scores of others she captured, and by their heartstrings led into our organization. Yet she steadfastly refused to marry. She dearly loved children, but she held that a child of her own would claim her from the cause, and that it was the cause to which her life was devoted. It was an easy task for Anna Royalston to win Timothy Donnelly. Her conscience did not trouble her, for at that very time occurred the Nashville Massacre, when the mercenaries, Donnelly in command, literally murdered eight hundred weavers of that city. But she did not kill Donnelly. She turned him over, a prisoner, to the Frisco Reds. This happened only last year, and now she had been renamed. The revolutionists everywhere are calling her the Red Virgin. Note. It was not until the Second Revolt was crushed that the Frisco Reds flourished again, and for two generations the group flourished. Then an agent of the Iron Heel managed to become a member, penetrated all its secrets, and brought about its total annihilation. This occurred in 2002 A.D. The members were executed one at a time, at intervals of three weeks, and their bodies exposed in the labor ghetto of San Francisco. Colonel Ingram and Colonel Van Gilbert are two more familiar figures that I was later to encounter. Colonel Ingram rose high in the oligarchy and became minister to Germany. He was cordially detested by the proletariat of both countries. It was in Berlin that I met him where, as an accredited international spy of the Iron Heel, I was received by him and afforded much assistance. Incidentally, I may state that in my dual role I managed a few important things for the revolution. Colonel Van Gilbert became known as Snarling Van Gilbert. His important part was played in drafting the new code after the Chicago Commune. But before that, as trial judge, he had earned sentence of death by his fiendish malignancy. I was one of those that tried him and passed sentence upon him. Anne Royalston carried out the execution. Still another figure arose out of the old life. 
Jackson's lawyer. Least of all would I have expected again to meet this man, Joseph Hurd. It was a strange meeting. Late at night, two years after the Chicago Commune, Ernest and I arrived together at the Benton Harbor Refuge. This was in Michigan, across the lake from Chicago. We arrived just at the conclusion of the trial of a spy. Sentence of death had been passed, and he was being led away. Such was the scene as we came upon it. The next moment the wretched man had wrenched free from his captors and flung himself at my feet, his arms clutching me about the knees in a vice-like grip as he prayed in a frenzy of mercy. As he turned his agonized face up to me, I recognized him as Joseph Heard. Of all the terrible things I have witnessed, never have I been so unnerved as by this frantic creature's pleading for life. He was mad for life. It was pitiable. He refused to let go of me, despite the hands of a dozen comrades. And when at last he was dragged shrieking away, I sank down fainting upon the floor. It is far easier to see brave men die than to hear a coward beg for life. Note. The Benton Harbor Refuge was a catacomb, the entrance of which was cunningly contrived by way of a well. It has been maintained in a fair state of preservation, and the curious visitor may today tread its labyrinths to the assembly hall, where, without doubt, occurred the scene described by Avis Everhard. Farther on are the cells where the prisoners were confined, and the death chamber where the executions took place. Beyond is the cemetery, long, winding galleries hewn out of the solid rock, with recesses on either hand, wherein, tier above tier, lie the revolutionists, just as they were laid away by their comrades long years gone. End of chapter 19 Recording by Matt Saw, Montreal, mattsaw.org